The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to join our Plantation Industry Exploration Webinar. And uh, today, we are very honored to have invited a renowned author, PC Wong, and also a speaker himself, to share with us what is his outlook on the plantation industry. And uh, this webinar is brought to you by Bruce Sam Malaysia and managed by our company Life Champ. And uh, my name is Shen Chu. I'm very honored to be your host today. Now, before I begin, just want to check if you can hear me. If you can hear me and see the webcam and see our screen, please click raise the hand button at the control panel. Okay, please click raise the hand button at the control panel. Okay. Let me see your hands. All right, you may put down your hands right now. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, now as usual, our disclaimer. Whatever we share on this webinar, whatever PCO share in this webinar, is only for educational purpose. Okay, in no way that we give any buy or sell recommendation to any of the companies that we may do a case study on. All right. So if you decide to do any investment based on whatever things you learn from this webinar, you do it at your own financial risk. Okay, Bruce Malaysia or not my company, I'm not going to be uh, held responsible for all of your uh, financial decisions. Okay. So as part of the Bruce Malaysia education webinar series we want to educate more retail investor to be able uh, to make a wise uh, investment decisions in your in managing your investment uh, portfolio as part of this uh, webinar series we have arranged three number one we have got a beginner webinar series whereby it's happening every first tuesday of the month um, these are the first five webinars that we have arranged for this year and uh, next month, we will see uh, a topic of conventional versus online investing. So if you are a newbie, if you are a rookie in investing, uh, join our beginner webinar series. Or if you have friends who are new to investing, ask them to join our beginner webinar series. Okay. And if you prefer to learn uh, investing in Chinese, we also have our Chinese webinar series, which is happening on every second Tuesday of the month. Okay. All right. Next month, we will have uh, Ricky Earn to talk about uh, what is the value investing trading strategy? But this will be conducted in Chinese. Okay, and the third series that we have is the intermediate to advanced webinar series. Okay, this is um, mainly designed for retail investors who have a bit more experience in the market. And today, the first topic we're going to do for the intermediate advanced webinar is by uh, PC Wong. Okay, yeah. thank you for joining us yeah. today. Thank you, and, uh, Shane, and thank you all for. Logging in. All right, cool. So you will be our first expert speaker to kickstart our intermediate and advanced webinar series. So for if you want to hear more about about the advanced webinar topics, uh, please tune in on every third Tuesday of the month. Every third Tuesday of the month, we will do this for the retail investors. Okay. Now uh, allow me to introduce uh, PC Wong a bit, and uh, he graduated from the NUS in 1989. He has more than 26 years of working experience in several public listed and multinational companies. As you have seen in the picture, he is uh, author of a book in Invest Reads, which reached popular top 10 non-fiction seller. And he's, he, your photo showed that you're doing a book launch drive with popular. Yes, yes. Yeah. And he also speaks very regularly for uh, financial institutions. Uh, he's a full-time investor, author, trainer, have been investing in Bursa international markets since 1995. So that is a little bit about his background. So today, what he is going to cover, if I uh, know it correctly, is you're going to talk about yes. how we can explore the outlook of plantation industry. Yeah. All right. And then he will share with us uh, how we can determine the risks and rewards of investing in the plantation industry. And uh, we will also learn what the future holds for the plantation industry. Okay. Now the question now is. You know, if you're aware, over the past uh, one to two years, you've seen that a uh, uh, crude palm oil price yes plunging down very yes. severely, right? Yes. Now I think it's doing at about two thousand one hundred yeah. ringgit. Yeah, it's also because uh, of the uh, trade war that helped to elevate it a bit. But as soon as the uh, 
the there's talk about trade deal and so forth. You know, there's no longer the uh, the the push to 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 push the oil price, uh, the crude palm oil price higher. So let's see what the industry holds. Yeah. So if you have already uh, if not yet invested in a plantation industry and you are, you want to see whether it is worth to invest or not, and in this session, PC will, will share more with you. All right. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is what is the plantation industry outlook. But before I talk about outlook, can you tell us like what exactly is a, a plantation industry and what, what is the products uh, revolve around? Yeah. The plantation industry uh, specific focus here will be palm oil, uh, which they also uh, goes into besides the crude palm oil there's also the oil chemicals and there's also the uh, all the way it's similar like the uh, oil and gas where they have uh, mm. upstream midstream and downstream so we'll be exploring those key uh, products for example crude palm oil uh, oil chemicals as well as the most um, uh, challenging one is actually the uh, 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 palm oil diesel yeah so that that product itself is also facing uh, tremendous challenges moving ahead. Mm, okay, so can you tell us like how is our palm oil export uh, doing? Uh? The okay, when you look at the uh, most recent market figures, yeah, um, Malaysia total palm oil export reached nine hundred ninety eight billion in twenty eighteen. Okay, rising six point seven percent versus twenty seventeen. Now, palm oil products export contributed 65.4 billion, and that's according to the uh, Malaysia Palm Oil Board, or 6.6% of total exports. When we compare to 2017 total value of palm oil products, export actually fell 12.4%, mainly due to lower prices. Now, in 2017, palm oil products export accounted for 8% of Malaysia total exports. Um, the Plantation may not seem to be uh, on the same uh, so-called economic, in terms of total export, it may not be in the same class like the uh, oil and gas, but that is also substantial because it counts for 8% of Malaysia total exports. Now, in terms of tonnage total palm oil products, export in 2018 amounted to 24.9 million tons versus 2017 or 24 million tons an increase of 3.8%. But because there's recent news came out that China has agreed to buy Malaysia palm oil, um, increasing the, uh, the purchase by about 50%, with a total value of about 891 million US dollars, that could see uh, the projection you know, uh, becoming higher in 2019. So, but what is the importance of palm oil and its usage? Now, as you can see that, you know, palm oil, we actually sell crude and then from crude, it goes into various industry uh, applications. Okay. And it goes all the way to uh, becoming uh, ingredients for baking, ingredients for frying, and also ingredients for the making of detergent, soap and such. Yeah. So, if you look at the palm oil outlook in 2019, now according to the Malaysian Palm Oil Council, uh, MPOC, in the report published in 19 February 27, uh, 2019, now palm oil prices are expected to be steady at an average price of around 2,303 uh, US um, ringgit per ton or US dollar of $656 per ton. Global output is, is expected to rise by 3 million tons to 72 million tons. Now, Malaysia palm oil export is expected to rise to 17.2 million tons this year, mainly due to rise in demand from primary markets. But again, this figure may actually go up in view that China has agreed to increase the import of palm oil from Malaysia. So this could be good news and a boost to uh, the plantation sector in terms of revenue. Now, the Malaysian palm oil bought forecast production to grow to 20.3 million tons in 2019 due to favorable weather conditions. So if you look at the global vegetable oil consumption, um, palm oil is actually uh, number one, okay? And then the uh, so soybean is actually number two, and rapeseed oil is actually number three. So uh, regardless, 
there are a lot of uh, competition from the uh, from other uh, type of vegetable oil. Palm oil still remains the most uh, consumed and most popular among among consumers. Yeah, and this data is actually from Statista. Now, global vegetable oil production and palm oil. Now, the first chart you see, you can see that from twenty um, sixteen onwards, there's a lot of uh, expansion in terms of uh, plantation, and therefore it caused the uh, uh, global vegetable oil production being increased uh, steadily since two thousand three, and you can see that. Uh, palm oil production has been outpacing other vegetable oil because it's on the top rung of the uh, production. Yeah, but 2016 actually marked the uh, higher, uh, bigger expansion. Okay, as you can see towards the uh, tail end of the chart, and that it that it coincides with the palm oil price falling. Okay, over the same period. Now, because of the trade war uh, with China. Palm oil actually got a minor lift uh, from the bottom uh, towards the end of 2018. Now, when all other sectors in the vegetable oil industry, okay, they also continue to expand, and this would cause a cap on the palm oil price moving forward. Because that's just too when there's overproduction, then definitely the loss of supply and demand applies. And therefore, the price would, could be under pressure because more production are put into the market. Yeah. So let's look at Malaysia palm oil export. Now, 2014, we export 17.3 million tons, value at 44.5 billion ringgit. In 2015, it is 17.5 million tons at 41.3 billion. 2016, 60 million tons at 43.4 billion ringgit. 2017, 16.6 million tons at 50 billion ringgit. Then 2018, 16.5 million tons, 41.0 billion. Yeah. So you can see that even as our export in between 2018 and 27, there's not much difference. But then the price in value actually fell by almost uh, nine. Billion because the ringgit. combined price go down. Yes, yes. So that's why when the industry, you know, when we talk about palm oil plantation, um, when we look at a decade ago, you know, there's there's always uh, news that Malaysia is exploring into Africa and so forth. But the most recent one, even countries in the uh, tropical regions in South America, they are also looking into the palm oil plantation. And that's why when you have a lot of ent um, entrance into uh, uh, into the market, a lot of people would actually create when there are too many when there are too many planters. Okay, it will create a huge supply, and therefore it will put a price on the uh, price of crude palm oil. So if you look at it, palm oil export has declined versus previous years. Okay, from 2014 to 2018, uh, and faces challenges in the form of lower prices and anti-palm oil activism and lobbies from developed nations. So often there's this um, uh, challenge, okay, from the Western or uh, developed nations who uh, who actually uh, try to sell their own vegetable oil, and therefore, unfortunately, palm oil is singled out as um, as a reason for them to uh, uh, to lobby against um, palm oil because uh, they link it with uh, deforestation and so forth, yeah, and also the uh, the the exploitation of indigenous people uh, worldwide. So, but they are also protecting their own uh, market of vegetable oil. For example, soybean oil as well as rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, and such. Yeah, so it's a very intense battle. So global overproduction is also an ongoing issue, and this needs to be addressed. Yeah, because every country is producing more. Yes, to yes, sell more. Yes. Okay. So yeah. that's that's one of the uh, key thing. Yeah. 
So in terms of oil chemicals demand, now global oil chemicals market is projected to reach 28.6 billion by 2025, according to a new report by Grandview Research. Demand is driven by growing biochemical product in various uh, consumer applications such as personal care, detergents, food and beverage. Now Asia Pacific was the leading consumer of oil chemicals. Okay, this region is also expected to witness the fastest growth over the next eight years owing to abundant raw material supply and significant developments in the application markets such as personal care, food and beverage and biochemical manufacture. Now, Asia Pacific also has one of the world's fastest growing population. Okay, later on, towards the end, I will share with you the demographic of the next decade in terms of uh, Asia middle class. Yeah, yeah I think uh, it was said that the uh, 19th century belongs to uh, British, UK, yeah. 20th century belongs to yeah. the US, and the 21st century belongs to it could be Asia. It China. could be China. Yeah. Okay, but uh, the surprise would be towards twenty thirty. There's one. Uh, there's two entrants into into the uh, into the grow fastest growing middle class, which is actually India, India. and Indonesia. Mm. Okay, which I will share with you later on. Yeah. So, palm oil and oil chemicals. Yeah. Let's look at it. Malaysia palm oil based oil chemicals export twenty fourteen is. Um, 2.83 million tons, okay. 2015 is 2.85, okay. That's not much change, okay. Then 20, uh, 2016 is 2.76 million tons, and that's a slight uptick in terms of value of 12.7 billion. Uh, 2017, 2.77 million tons at 15.5 billion ringgit. Then 2018, 3 million tons, but 14.3 billion ringgit. So because of the lower price of crude palm oil, it also exert a certain uh, pressure on the price of oil chemicals as well. Because if the uh, if um, if let's say the for example like oil, okay, the normal oil and gas, okay, if let's say oil price increase, yeah, even down to the retailer, the oil price would also increase. Yeah. Similarly, crude oil, it, crude palm oil is also no different, and it impacts also the price of oil chemicals. Now, although palm oil-based oil chemicals export increased in 2018 versus previous year, total value has fallen short due to lower prices. When we talk about palm oil and biodiesel, okay, Malaysia palm oil-based biodiesel export 2014 is 87.4 kilotons. Okay, value at 257 million ringgit. 2015 is 178 uh, point nine kilotons, which is 483. Now that's a huge uh, increase, yeah, of almost uh, more than doubling, yeah. Mm -hmm. So 2016 is 83.6 kilotons at 247. Now 2016 it dropped back. Okay, 2017 it went back up again, 235. Uh, Point three kilotons value at seven hundred and seventy seven million ringgit. Yeah. Well, so like roller coaster. Up yeah. Down. <laughs> so twenty eighteen five hundred and fifteen point five kilotons at one point four three uh, billion ringgit. So actually, in terms of value, it has increased quite a lot, but that coincides with increase with volume. So biodiesel export seems to be gaining strength, but by twenty twenty, EU nations cannot increase their import of biodiesel. Okay, now this is a warning sign. Bad okay. news. Yes. Yeah. And after 2023, the demand will gradually decline until 2030 when demand will come to a halt. Now this is from the uh, Transport and Environment published on the 2nd of July 2018. So while there's a lot of uh, demand for biodiesel right now, okay, because of the requirement in the European uh, uh, union to have blended uh, fuel for vehicles. So that's why, you know, there's, there's a demand, okay, to rush in to meet certain deadlines, okay. But then uh, by 2023, the, the, they will, they cannot increase the import anymore from, uh, from, uh, of biodiesel, okay. And then will decline at 2030, demand will altogether stop. 
Okay, now this will result in biodiesel losing the lucrative uh, EU market. This will impact all types of biodiesel, including palm oil-based yeah. biodiesel. So those uh, manufact those uh, manufacturers that have the that can produce biodiesel from palm oil in Malaysia. Yeah has to have a backup plan how yes, they can yes. utilize the uh, existing yes. fixed asset yeah. uh, on that. Yeah, so that's why because of all these uh, uh, um, so-called policies coming forward, yeah, I think uh, Malaysia uh, plantation companies have to be very, very nimble okay, and constantly look for new markets for their products. And EU is a big market yes, you know, for yes. Malaysia. I think it's yeah. the second biggest market. Yeah, if you look at oil. the EU palm oil consumption uh, okay, you can see that uh, from the chart here, yeah, EU has been ramping up import of biodiesel, okay, which is the darker color, okay, but this will start to decline from 2023 onwards and hot by 2030. Now, in the meantime, food, feed, and industry consumption is also gradually declining, okay. I think partly there are there are a few reasons, okay. Um, one is that the uh, negative uh, impact from the lobbyist, okay, because they, they try to lobby for other vegetable oil, okay, and they painted a lot of uh, a lot of negative uh, information about Malaysia or, or, Asia, uh, or you know, uh, 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 about palm oil uh, globally, okay, that uh, is affecting the forest in, in, the, uh, in the South America, Africa, and also in Asia. Mm -hmm. So it is a very, uh, ongoing battle. Okay, we should get our minister to go there and lobby again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, what are the challenges confronting biodiesel? Now, world is moving towards clean energy, which is a reduction in emission. Okay. Natural gas, solar, wind, tide, hydro, and geothermal are leading the green energy evolution. More nuclear plants are being built to reduce dependence on fossil fuel. Okay. Between 2025 and 2050, European nations such as, uh, including um, country, other countries like China and India are expected to ban all ICE, which is internal combustion engine vehicles, okay? which means it's going to be going fully electric. So there's really no, no need okay, to add biodiesel to blend with existing fuel. Okay? And on top of that, whether biodiesel can be used uh, for for let's say energy generation, okay, that is also uh, not uh, not so feasible owing to a shift now, uh, a global move towards natural and renewables. Okay, so then the other thing confronting the challenges of biodiesel is that all this will all all the clean energy and policies okay will alter the landscape in oil consumption and outside of a major geopolitical crisis oil price is likely to stay low in the future now this could impact the demand for biodiesel so if let's say oil price is really down it's really low okay and then to blend biodiesel is a costly thing people will just do a cost benefit analysis and, may, and maybe they might just opt for ordinary fossil fuel and not a bio-based fuel so you say oil price will stay low in the future, like like. Yeah. What is your horizon, time horizon? I think the for oil price up to twenty twenty five, I think we can see some good price in uh in the uh, crude oil, yeah, in oil, uh, mainly because of the a lot of the U.S. shale oil producers they are facing a lot of uh tremendous challenge in the debt burden. And a lot of the debt will come due between this year and 2023. So also the best, um, the best part of the Permian Basin, um, Eagle Fort Basin, they have already taken all the best part of the oil out. Okay, so now they have to take, they have to actually, uh, uh, they actually have to come up with newer technology and more costly venture to actually break up the remaining parts of the shield oil. In fact, US oil production is uh, has already reached a peak and it's coming down. So because of something will happen to the US shale industry, uh, oil price would actually stay quite uh, the, quite on a on an uptrend if I if, if I think so if I may think so okay over the next few years. So in that sense, okay, biodiesel would still 
uh, be, uh, be having a, a role in the market. But as soon as the shift goes into electric vehicle and the banning of ICE, then you will see a gradual fall in demand of uh, oil as well as the need for biodiesel. So what you're talking now is actually pretty long term la, because like 2025 is like still yeah, about six years yeah, ahead from now. Yeah. And then the, you mean the oil price will likely to stay low is probably looking at about 10 years. Yes. On, on after, after 2025, when the, when the uh, first few countries in the European Union will start to implement uh, fully electric vehicles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that would actually then cause oil price to, to, to fall. Um, but of course, you know, when we talk about between now and then, there will be advancement in technology, okay? And maybe certain technology would suddenly uh, be, uh, would require, you know, either biodiesel or uh, the traditional uh, crude oil, okay? In order to produce something, we don't know. But based on existing conditions, okay, and with the implementation of full banning of ICE in European nations will come first in 2025. Then, of course, you know, where 62 thirds of the global oil consumption is used for vehicles, then that would definitely impact upon the price of oil. And also biodiesel uh, in, that, in, in that sense, yeah. So the other thing is, um, stigma against biodiesel because land use for biodiesel could be used to farm for food, especially when population growth puts stress on global food supply chain, resulting in inflation. Okay, and even right now, you know, there's a lot of attacks against uh, Malaysian uh, or uh, Malaysian plantation companies uh, about them uh, uh, partaking in uh, deforestation and so forth. Okay, but. Again, you know, in let's say in the uh, in US, you know, the the kind of you know um, corn corn oil used for ethanol in the US, the amount of land that they use to produce corn oil just for just for another bio biofuel product, okay, is actually enough to feed a large population. You know, instead of converting corn into fuel, they use corn into food. So then again, you know, it's like. Uh, uh, because of interest, you know, some are fighting for soybeans, some are fighting for corn oil. Therefore, it's much easier to label against palm oil because they can always use that in terms of uh, deforestation. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's the uh, that's one ha uh, one thing. On the other is that all this use of uh, bio product, okay, also will put pressure on the. Uh, global food supply chain in the future because arable land in the world is actually limited yeah and but there's one pros prospect okay and that is to convert palm oil feed stock into biomass for power generation now this this is another sector i think is rather young and i think that uh, instead of just uh, thinking of converting crude palm oil okay into biodiesel and uh, the other thing is look at biomass okay uh, for power generation. Um, in China, for example, you know, they are using agricultural feedstocks uh, that are used, for example, you know, like uh, if you look at it, like rice, after they've taken the rice out, okay, the stocks and all those are used for biomass uh, to, to, to generate power. Okay, so uh, that's one thing to consider, okay, in, in using uh, uh, the uh, after they have extracted the oil, what is left over can be used as feedstock for biomass in terms of power generation. Then you can actually, uh, for example, you know, a plantation company may also, you know, on one hand, use the uh, um, mill the mill the uh, the uh, uh, fruit bunches and then have the oil, but then the Extracted oil, they can also use it for biomass to actually generate electricity for the whole, um, maybe oleochemical plant and so on to reduce the, the cost. So a, a lot of industry worldwide right now are, ch are changing. Okay, for example, uh, some some industry in China, while they are while they are using a feedstock, their factory flat roof, rooftop 
is being used as a solar farm so that they are able to um, use the electricity generating from solar power to save costs. Okay, so that's that, that's one thing to consider also how to recycle back. Okay, and uh, and what's left of the fruit bunches after the abstraction of oil. Okay, when you use it for biomass, uh, power generation is also another option. Yeah, so risks and rewards in uh, plantation yeah. investing. Yeah, can you tell us like more about that? Yeah, so if you look at it, okay, palm oil is a commodity and therefore it's exposed to the cyclical demand and supply. Okay, higher demand often results in overplanting and therefore creates long term damage to the price. Now, this is again the same chart which I shared just now. You can see that because oil price was you know started to move up, okay, uh, during the uh, 2014 to 2015 period, you can see that there's acceleration in opening up new plantations. So the production keep increasing over the years. Yeah. So that's why eventually it caused the price to fall. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you have over planting, okay, or even whatever resources, whether over mining or over drilling, over over production, often will create a, a cap on the progression of the price. And then if let's say it reaches a certain limit, then you can only go and that one way you can only go and that's down. Okay, so challenges confronting biodiesel could also pose a risk to further downside in terms of price. Okay, competition from other vegetable oil, which could erode demand of palm oil. Negative PR by lobbyists in developed nations against palm oil. So these are the risks that sometimes uh, are associated with plantation investing. Yeah. So let's look at the rewards. Palm oil has multi usage with many industrial applications. And therefore, its demand is likely to increase over time, especially when you talk about detergents, when you talk about uh, uh, consumable oil, okay, for example, oil used for frying, baking, okay, and in terms of personal hygiene, yes, then there will be constant uh, demand for uh, oil chemicals, yeah. As reported by Grand Wheel Research, Asia Pacific will see the fastest growth in demand for oil chemicals in the next eight years. This is also the same region which will see the fastest growth in population and also the biggest increase in middle income earners in the coming decade. Growth in middle income earners will also augur new consumption patterns, especially in the demand for better food and beverage, personal hygiene care and industrial manufacturing. Now, if we want to compare, you know, we can just refer to Malaysia export to China before, uh, before 1990s and also Malaysia export to China now because the consumption pattern has changed. Okay, previously when a country is less developed, the people, um, the the people, the middle income group is very very small. You know, you don't have people thinking about eating pastry. You don't have people thinking about personal care, uh, products. Okay, if you can, if you just have soap, then that's in, that's enough. Right now, you know, there are so many personal care products. Okay, because they have moved up the value chain. So that's why. You know, as long as the middle income earners in Asia Pacific continue to grow, that demand will actually continue to grow as well. That yeah. will be a good news yeah. for us. Yeah. So hopefully, if let's say biodiesel starts to taper off over the next decade, but because of the growth in middle income earners in the Asia Pacific region, that will actually offset uh, some of the uh, negative uh, impact of the uh, biodiesel uh, being less popular in the European nations. Yeah. Now all this could lead to even greater demand for palm oil in the future, which helps to stabilize, stabilize the price. Now, how do we weigh the risk and rewards? Okay. And what you need to do is knowing how to weigh your criteria in investing in a plantation. Now you can consider some of this, how to reduce risks, which are subjected to cyclical fluctuation in prices. Multiple income streams, upstream to downstream versus single income stream, up, whether it's upstream, midstream, or just downstream only. So on one hand, you need to understand the risk. Okay, then you want to look at multiple income streams so that it helps to reduce the risk further. Can you tell us what is an upstream in a palm oil plantation? Okay, like upstream could be like in 
the uh, preparing the seedling. Okay, then in terms of harvesting and all those midstream would so be upstream in the will building. mean they own many many hectares. Or yes, hackers, yes, they need to few thousands, few tens of thousands. Yeah. Of, uh, so you need to prepare the land. Okay, you need to prepare the land. Okay, you need to grow the seedling, transform the seedling into the uh, plantations. Okay, then harvesting. Okay, but then midstream will be in terms like milling. Okay, then downstream crunching it, yeah. make sure that the oil yes, extract yes, oil. Okay. Yes, downstream is when that uh, that uh, crude palm oil is converted into different types of chemicals. Okay, to suit uh, products mm -hmm. uh, needs. Yeah. Okay. So if you were to invest, like which sector, you know, upstream, midstream, or downstream, which one is more is safer or more defensive? I think for me, I would look at an all rounder. Okay. All rounder. Yeah, they are involved in everything vertically integrated, integrated. because uh -huh. because you you must understand that if you are just selling crude palm oil, okay, if the price is low, then your revenue would react accordingly. But if let's say you also have downstream. Okay, in terms of production of oil chemicals, as the population grows, the demand will be there. Okay, but then because of over planting, the crude palm oil, although demand may be rising, but then the crude palm oil price may not rise enough. But because you are in the uh, oil chemical production and there's a lot of, uh, you have a wide population that, that consume the product, then the quantity. Although the price may not be it may not increase a lot, but then the, by the sheer quantity of the population consumption, then that would actually help to support the revenue. Yeah. Yeah, but if the uh, if the palm oil price go up, I think the upstream uh, business will be very well. Yeah, right? they, they, they But the downstream business will be not be so happy, right? Because they need to buy more expensive sure, sure, palm oil sure. from that's why if let's say it's vertically integrated, yeah. uh, it's just like left pocket, go right pocket. You know, it's the same company. So that's why in terms of if I want to uh, you know, spread the risk across, I will look at a fully vertically integrated uh, plantation player. Mm. Okay. Do we have them in Malaysia, Margaret? Yes, yes. After I share one particular uh, company. So Excellent. Um, the other thing is that companies must look at you know, uh, high cost efficiencies across the broad business spectrum. So a company must be able to achieve cost efficiencies. Okay in their operations, whether in terms of the upstream, midstream or downstream. Okay, highly successful company with strong management team. You want to look at companies that have a very strong management team and dedicated management team. And this reflected how, how good a company is. Okay, whether they have a good management team, you can always look at, you know, like the trend, five year trend report. Or um, that they had the the equity, okay. The equity value did not uh, did not drop too drastically, or that the equity value has gained over a period of time. So when when a management team is good, they will actually grow the shareholders' equity, okay. And that's that's a very important thing, okay. Because then growing the equity adds value to the company. You invest, you want a company that adds value to the equity, so that it's you know the share price would also react according to the increase in the equity. Yeah. So another thing, of course, is a company with proven track record. Okay. So today's case study will look at KL Kepong. Now, before uh, before we start, okay, this is not a buy call for KL Kepong. Yeah? It's just that I'm using it as an example of a vertically integrated company. Okay. So Listed on Busa, main board under code 2445, one of the biggest players in the palm oil industry. Has a plantation land bank that is close to 285,000 hectares spread across Malaysia, Peninsula and Sabah, Indonesia, uh, which is in Belitung Island, Sumatra, Central and East Kalimantan, and Liberia, which is actually in Africa. Okay, over the years, KLCare vertically integrated its upstream and downstream businesses. It has expanded its manufacturing to cover Malaysia, China, Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Indonesia, resulting in internationally scaled oleochemicals operations. Okay. Now, so sometimes you know um, there are certain pluses in having a, a plant overseas in the sense that whatever you ship there is towards that particular plant and immediately is processed, catering to the 
uh, consumers there. Okay, rather than uh, you when when you when you want to do everything here and when you export, there's always the problem with transportation and also the period to transport. Yeah, so that's why sometimes uh, bigger companies would like to relocate their plant directly to their where their customers are located. So if you look at the location of operations, okay, in terms of um, uh, it's all over uh, Southeast Asia mostly. Okay, sorry, Liberia is actually in South, South uh, yeah, it's actually in West Africa. Okay, I thought for a while that map was <laughs> South Africa. <laughs> okay, it's in Africa, yeah. So then if you look at it, okay, their presence, their product is all over Europe, uh, China and Southeast Asia. So what is their operations? Now it is from nursery, planting, okay, and then fill upkeep to harvesting, processing to uh, GHG uh, management and R&D. So it's actually all integrated together within the same company, uh, uh, various uh, departments here. So if you look at the Q1 2019 results, if you look at the income statement, now despite this falling revenue, which you can see that is um, uh, the revenue for the uh, financial year 2019, yeah, okay, is 4 billion versus 5 billion the previous year, okay. Although revenue is short of, uh, is short, yeah, share results from Associates and JV help to move the net profit higher year on year, which you can see that uh, uh, down below, okay. Now, this is why having multiple income streams are very important, okay. So, if you look at the Q1 2019 uh, balance sheet, now why you need to look at the balance sheet? Because the balance sheet is a tool to measure a company's financial soundness. Okay, that's very important. Yeah. A lot of people sometimes look at the uh, income statement. Okay, then they look at the PE and then they make their decision. But the balance sheet is very important because it is a tool to measure a company's financial soundness. And if I may add on, uh, the uh, yeah. especially for plantation industry, which are more uh, asset-driven kind of yes. business, yes. and uh, for balance sheet should be more important because yes. unlike services or e-commerce, uh, yeah. digital services, yeah. so plantation, you really need to invest in acquiring the land, yes. yeah, planting the... Building the plant. plant. Uh, building the plant so and all those balance uh, sheet will be crucial yes yeah, so understand because, the health of the company yeah because some companies um they they may incur a lot of debt in uh in initiating a uh let's say an oil chemical plant because it costs a lot of money mm. they will incur a lot of debt okay and if let's say their business is debt driven then that company is more at risk okay so let's look at financial strength now how do you assess a plantation company's financial strength okay versus uh, via the balance sheet. Number one is plantation is a capital intensive industry requiring funds for acquisition of land and building processing plants, including chemical plants. Now, a plantation company, therefore, should have the following criteria. Current ratio, which is the current assets over the current liabilities of more than one. Okay, now, if why I say it needs to be this more is than your one. criteria. Yes, yes. This is my personal criteria. Okay, you can set your own criteria, but I'm just sharing my criteria in this regard. Now, why why do I say they need to be more than one? Because current liabilities is commitments that the company must fulfill. Okay, to um, uh, over a twelve month period. Now, if let's say your current assets is lower than the commitment that you have to pay out. Okay, then how, how is the company going to meet that commitment? So if, let's say it cannot be satisfied by increase in uh, earnings, then what next would be a, like, a likely solution, increase in debt. So that's why for my criteria, list of criteria, this is one of those that the current ratio must always be more than one. Okay, so this is a measure of the adequacy of company assets to meet current commitment. Okay, debt to equity ratio, which is the total liabilities over total equity, must be less than 1.5. Now, I put it at 1.5, again, it's my own personal criteria, uh, because if let's say it's, because a company that is in the plantation business, they incur debt, definitely. So if you put the debt to equity ratio over uh, that 
must be less than one is not really very practical because the amount of um, borrowing could well exceed that because they need a longer time frame to actually pay off their borrowing. So therefore, I put it at 1.5. Okay, it measures the extent of a leverage in a company. Okay, now these are my personal benchmarks. Okay, KLK okay, in this case has a current ratio of 2.19. Okay, more than sufficient funds to meet um, current liabilities and a debt to equity ratio of 0 0.6, therefore meeting my personal benchmark for financial strength. Okay, this is how I look at a company to evaluate their financial strength. Now you can actually change the, uh, uh, let's say if you want to measure the company uh, with more stringent requirement, you can put current ratio must be more than 1.2. It's also up to you. If you want to be a, you know, you do not want to uh, be so nicky picky. You say that you know, as long as the company make money, it's okay. You know, I don't, you know, if their current ratio doesn't meet that one, it's also okay. I maybe put it at 0 0.8. Okay, that is your, whatever criteria you set, bear in mind, it is your own acceptance of your own risk level. Okay, so if you put 0 0.8, yes, you are someone that is, you know, has has uh, has more aversion for risk, okay, that you want, you, you don't mind, okay, to take risk, okay, but uh, some people might put 1.2, so that, you know, they want a, even a safer company, for them to consider before investing yeah so these are some things that you can use to evaluate and also put in the figures that meets your own risk acceptance yeah now other metrics now it is important that a company must be cash flow positive in this regard KLK's operating cash flow is 234 million in Q1 2019 versus negative 175 79 million a year ago now, negative cash flow from operating at this may be a concern, but if the cash flow is used for business expansion, then that could be good for a company. Because sometimes companies may see that there's an opportunity to really expand a particular uh, segment, okay? And therefore, they, they take that as an opportunity and it's okay for them to burn that, uh, to, to use up that cash flow for that business expansion. And some companies may be, just focus in accumulating cash. So it's up to you to evaluate, you know, how important it is. For example, if let's say it's negative cash flow, then you must find out the reason why is there a negative cash flow. Okay. If you find out the reason, hey, the company use it for expansion, you know, they actually expanded uh, 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 um, their business, they expanded their marketing, they they use it to uh, to fight against the lobbies or whatsoever, you know, anything that is being used for a reason. As long as it's a good reason, then even even though for that particular quarter it's a negative cash flow, do not be too overly concerned. What you need to do then, okay, is the next quarter. If the next quarter is back to positive, then you know there's really no need to be too overly concerned. But if consistently every quarter is negative cash flow, then you need to be a bit more um, uh, attentive to what is being spent. Yeah. So the other thing is price to earning ratio, but price to earning ratio is often very uh, uh, that you just look at, you know, for example, people would say that, you know, a PE less than 15, you know, is, is very, very good. Okay. If PE more than 15, you know, then don't buy is overvalued. Now that is very subjective. Okay. Because certain ICT companies, because of their uh, profile of the high growth nature, they tend to have higher PE. Okay, so people invest in companies because they want to look at the future. If everyone is piling into the company, yes, the price to earning ratio will be much higher. Okay, so you, but how do you know that it's actually high? That is why you need to compare with peers. And in this sense, okay. We look at the PE ratio for KLK, which is 38.66. IOI Corp is 40.16. United Plantation is 15.29. Sime Darby Plantation is 66.62. Okay, so what you can see is that, hey, United Plantation actually have a very, very low PE. So should I then invest in United Plantation? 
Fair enough. If let's say you you if you do a comparison, plantation United Plantation has a much lower PE, and that certainly arouses your curiosity. Then you go back to the same method in evaluating its income statement, in evaluating its uh, in evaluating its balance sheet to make sure that United Plantation meets the criteria that you have set. Okay. So any in but one thing. Any measurement involving EBITDA needs further scrutiny at, as it exempts items which could impact a company's bottom line. So sometimes companies, they have no net profit to, to report. Okay, so what they do, they use EBITDA. Okay, because for example, why I don't like to use EBITDA measurements here is because it's earnings before interest, depreciation, taxation, and amortization. Now, if a company incurs a lot of that definitely if the interest would be very high. So if I take out that portion of the interest, hey, suddenly my earnings would look better, isn't it? The same if let's say a company, you know, use a lot of debt to invest in plant and machinery, the depreciation will also be very high. So if I take out interest, if I take out depreciation, okay, then I could be positive, having a positive EBITDA. So that's why, you know, when it comes to EBITDA, you need to really be very, very, cautious okay but for my own uh, assessment of companies i actually totally ignore EBITDA because i want to see the hard real facts of the net profit which is more important to me okay again it's my preference yeah so EBITDA is something that uh, uh wall street people invented so that the number yes. is better right yes so <laughs> just like just like wall street invent you know, if you look at CNBC, Bloomberg, you see that every time they announce EPS, they never announce what is the total net profit or net profit growth. They, they also they just use EPS. Why? Because since 2009 to present, for the whole 10 years, Wall Street companies okay, listed on the S&P index or Dow or whatever, they've been using that to buy back their shares. So that now, okay, if I'm not wrong, essentially total corporate debt in the US right now is about, is higher than the corporate debt during the 2008 financial crisis. So that's why some companies, they just use EPS. Of course, if you buy, use, use debt to buy back shares, the number of shares in circulation is reduced. So of course, earnings would actually go up. So Net profit may not go up, but earning per share may go up. So you have to be very discerning in that matter. Okay. So uh, Wall Street like to come up with a lot of things that, you know, just to push the, the stock price higher. And thankfully, you know, sometimes Malaysia has, has more scrutiny over these kind of things. And thankfully, a lot of people still pay attention where Malaysian companies are concerned, you know, where you're investing in Pusat. The common sense still prevail in that people still look at, hey, net profit growth, la, revenue growth, la, and all those. Don't just look at EPS, okay? Because you still need to take charge of, not in, take into consideration of the depreciation, which are non-cash expense and all the yeah. interest that yeah. the company will serve yeah. uh, for all the debt that they borrow. So if, but if we look at all the PE ratio, um, uh, from four PE ratio they have shared for, from these four companies, uh, it mm -hmm. appears to me that the uh, plantation industry PE ratio is still relatively on the high side. Yeah. Yeah. Even though the, the price of the crude palm oil has been uh, falling. Yeah. And the PE ratio surprisingly is still can can still sustain at the above on general above thirty over. Yeah. I think sometimes people buy into it for multiples of reasons. Uh, okay. One is that some some investors may see that uh, plantation is a very steady business. Okay. That's constant demand. Okay. Uh. And as I shared with you just now, a chart from Statista, okay? Palm oil consumption, okay? In terms of vegetable oil consumption, palm oil is still number one in the world. So when, when, when you are faced with this kind of facts, people will think that, hey, you know, yeah, the price may become, may be down and all that, but palm oil is still number one. Yeah. So yeah. I want yeah. stability in my portfolio, mm -hmm. okay? And also certain counters do pay good dividends now. So that's why that's again that uh, people want to go into plantation because it's for security, uh, for security for for us for example, okay. Um, people would want to have a portfolio of a combination of stocks, 
and sometimes plantation may be the may be the foundation that they want to because it's always in demand okay although price might fall but then you know it's, there's always a need for palm oil okay and therefore it provides uh, a, a kind of a safety net okay for your investment and that's why people would actually um, want to have hey no matter what my portfolio I want to have a bit of plantation okay and that's why that's that's this uh, that's that's this uh, uh, demand for it okay of course a lot of people are also looking forward that um, price of uh, crude palm oil may one day move up okay and then they will reap the benefit so again people may be positioning in advance or something okay so uh, depends on the behavior of the investor okay yeah so now um before we go into the plantation industry future let's do a quick poll okay so the question here i have is on your screen do you think plantation company share price will go up in this year i mean we are talking about a sector the, the sector based kind of outlook sorry do you think whether the share price will go up in this year i'm just doing a uh, survey. So, if you think it's definitely yes, you have you have firm belief that it will go up. Uh, click definitely yes. If you have firm belief that it will still drop, click definitely no. If you are in between, maybe you say I'm not sure. Okay, give you about another uh, fifteen seconds. Okay, let me close the poll and share the result with you. So based on the opinion of all our a few hundred online attendees tonight, you see that 33% of you say the share price will go up. Sector outlook should be better this year. I mean the share price. 25% of you say no. And while 42% of you say I'm not sure. Okay. So this is the 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 answer, uh, the opinion from the online attendees today. All right. So let me go back to the slide. So yeah. So could you PC you just now you yeah. cover uh, KLK as one of the case study to tell the teacher what you said. Uh, vertically integrated yeah. uh, palm oil uh, company, and you also cover a bit more on uh, a few products earlier on like biodiesel and oil chemicals and stuff can you tell us whether this what is what is your outlook for this uh, uh, plantation industry okay now what i'm going to talk about uh for the future okay has a lot to do with science first. science okay now wow. uh this, you're a scientist yeah <laughs> um this is something that i think a lot of people will not find it in the mainstream media okay because uh there's a lot of undercurrents of what's happening globally and it has to do with uh, scientific, uh, uh, some scientific research done. Okay, so um, maybe you can uh, later we can also poll. You know, uh, have anyone ever heard about solar minimum and grand solar minimum? What are <laughs> these two things? Yeah. So actually, it sounds like climate change kind of stuff. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, very much so. Okay. Now, previously, um, recent years. Uh, the sun actually have sunspots. Yeah, when sunspots actually denote the activity in the sun, but recently there have not been any sunspots, and that means that the sun is going to go undergoing some changes. So when you see recently referred specifically to like when I think uh, just about a year or so ago that this uh, grand solar minimum theory started to come out. Because the sun has, you know, scientists have been monitoring the surface of the sun for many, many years. Okay, but they noticed something uh, very real happening. And therefore, right now, there's a lot of scientists that are uh, suggesting that we could be having a grand solar minimum. What is a grand solar minimum? Okay, what it is. Now, so if you want to know a bit more, okay, you can go to this, the grand solar minimum. Dot com and read more about it 
Okay, now roughly every 11 years, the sun's magnetic field completely flips. Okay, which means that the sun north and south poles switch places. Okay, it then takes approximately another 11 years for the sun north and south poles to flip back again. So that means the, the like, yeah, the, the magnetic really, pole actually change. That okay. is interesting. Yeah. Okay. So this solar cycle affects activity on the surface of the sun, such as sunspots, which are caused by the sun. Uh, magnetic fields and as the magnetic fields change so does the amount of activity on the sun's surface now the amount of activity on the sun's surface can influence the earth temperature and thus its weather conditions okay you can see that on the red side that's called the model minimum okay which happened during the uh, um, 17th to 18th century okay then we have the uh, sunspots okay move being prevalent, and then you see the blue lines, okay, that means that the sunspot activity. But recently, okay, if you go after the year 2000, you can see that the activity in the sun is actually dropping. So what is Grand Solar Minimum? Now in the Global Warming Policy Foundation in 2018 October, Professor Valentina uh, Zakova gave a presentation of a climate and the solar magnetic magnetic field hypothesis. Yeah? Zakova models solar sunspot and magnetic activity. That's what she does. Yeah? Her models have run at 93% accuracy and her findings suggest a super grand solar minimum could begin in 2020. So not only a grand solar minimum, but a super grand yes. solar minimum. A okay. super grand solar minimum could have four magnetic fields out of phase. That was about 40 to 60 years of cold weather 350 years ago. So we are talking about decades, you know. Okay. No, it's not decades, there are three centuries, right? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> 40 to 60 years of cold. We are talking about decades of cold. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, which happened 350 years ago. Now, this was the model minimum, okay, of lower solar activity. The historical cold weather had two magnetic fields out of phase. Right now, we are talking about four. So that's why people say that the grand solar minimum could be could be heralding a mini ice age. Are you kidding yeah. us? Yeah. Okay. 2020, then we don't have to buy 2020 anymore. onwards. Now it could um uh, now I still feel very hot. It doesn't mean that the whole world becomes cold, you know. Okay, but because of the arrangement of our polarity, okay, when certain place is cold, somewhere else it will be very hot. Okay, and I'll share the example of those. Okay, now this is from the next big future com. If you want to read about it, you can go to that website. Okay, there are more studies uh, um, of uh, uh, Professor uh, Zakova's findings. Yeah. So what happened is that impact on world food supply chain. Okay, how likely will that happen? Very likely, if I, let's say sure. it's already really, happening this year. I'm, I've got very concerned, but if it happened this year, I don't feel very cold yet. Yes, but that I was... I feel very hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah true, true. It's warmer this year here. Yeah, yeah. but the, 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 the icebergs are still melting, you know, at the North Pole and the yeah, South Pole. But certain changes are already undergoing elsewhere. So let's look at it. You know, how does a Grand Solar Minimum impact on the world's food supply chain? Now, Northern Hemisphere could become colder, while the Southern Hemisphere could be warmer. Both instances could disrupt global food supply. Uh, global food production. So that's why we see like uh, New York, you know, it's get, uh, America are getting heavier, heavier snow. And yes, water. yes. It may not happen throughout the world, but it's already happening in pockets, part of the world. Okay, now if you look at the picture on your uh, right hand side, the top one, you see a lot of fish, uh, uh, a lot of fish being dead here. Yeah? Now that's what happening in the uh, Murray Darling Basin. Hundreds and thousands of fish died because temperature rose if I'm not wrong, about two, two or four degrees. Where, where is this moray? Australia. It's in Australia. Okay. And in the meanwhile, in North America, you have a, a, a extreme cold. Now, if you go to YouTube, there's a, there's a video of uh, what they call an ice tsunami happening in the, uh, tsunami. In the Great Basins. Yeah. Where is the Great Basin? In the sand, you know the uh, where the Niagara Falls is. Uh -huh. They call it the Great Basin. Uh, uh -huh. All the all the major lakes there. 
yeah, Lake yeah. Superior, yeah, Irie, Superior, and all okay. those. Yeah. So what happened was the wind caused the ice to float uh, above each other, and then the winds become so strong that the ice sheet of ice are uh, moved against the shore, creating a tsunami of ice. So this is a ice tsunami from one of the biggest lake in the, in the yeah. world. Yeah. Okay. So, but it, um, so, but the, the, it doesn't come from the ocean, right? it's come from yeah, it's the lake, uh, yeah. inland lake. Yeah, yeah. inland lake. Yeah, it, it, you know, you go to YouTube, you look at you, you type sure? a search okay, ice, okay. ice tsunami, then then you will see. I would be very interested to yeah. find this out. So now, as recent as this year, Australia saw warmer temperatures, killing hundreds and thousands of fish in the Murray Darling River basin, and North America experienced a polar vortex. In fact, uh, just about a month ago. Chicago temperature was even colder than the Arctic because of the polar <laughs> vortex. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So what happened is that you can see that now the disruption is taking place. Yeah? So plantations could be destroyed or harvest being negatively impacted. Now this could exert inflation on the food supply chain. Okay, because now you imagine that if certain uh, the northern hemisphere become much colder Southern Hemisphere will become even warmer. If you look at it, even us in the equatorial, yeah, so our weather now is much hotter, and we have more thunderstorms. Okay. Do you realize that? Okay. So how will that affect our oil palm plantation? If let's say there's a lot of thunderstorm, okay. Now what happened was, you know, you remember a few years back when a lot of flooding in Johor, in 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 Pahang, Kelantan, and all yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. a lot of the oil palm crops they uh, were destroyed also because of the heavy flooding. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the output could be disrupted. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, maybe the price will go up. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Not only that, because if you so, look at things like rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, mm, where soybean they? oil, they are in temperate countries. Okay. So if let's say, um, for example, Russia now is producing a lot of uh, soybean, uh, for China's consumption. Okay, now their plantation is in Siberia. Now, what happened if let's say the weather suddenly shift very cold and the soybean harvest is affected or the soybean uh, uh, crops are being destroyed? China would be looking for vegetable oil. Okay, so that is why you know this weather change caused by the Grand Solar Minimum is going to impact a lot of food production globally. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How about all this uh, carbon footprint? Uh, I, I because I thought th this uh, climate change was like a uh, oh, like yeah. You can carbon. You can control what you emit uh, on Earth, but you cannot control what's coming from the sun. <laughs> okay, and that is what is coming. Okay, so now if Professor Sakova's uh, finding are true, uh, we can be talking about from twenty twenty onwards. 40 to 60 years of cold weather, then we can look, we, we will be looking at 40 to 60 years of, you know, the whole global weather system, you know, becoming topsy turvy. Okay. And that is why um, I think, well, it may be good for plantation counters, yeah, because it exerts a price. What comes next will be a lot of inflation. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> okay. If the power price go up, output drop, then of course you know. For, <laughs> yeah, you know you will have food inflation also. Okay, so whether is it good for plantation, but then bad for everything? Okay, for example, if inflation goes up, what will happen to properties? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> But if you know, you know climate change really happens, it will affect us severely. Yeah. Probably we will see Chicago temperature is lower than those in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but definitely it's, it's lower than Arctic. Yeah. Uh, lower than Arctic. That, that is day. insane. Okay? Yeah. And uh, I've been to Chicago twice, and I think Chicago was really quite cold in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it fell to, I think the worst was minus 35 degree Chicago. Oh, wow. You Celsius, know? right? You're yeah, Celsius. Right, right. Um, and Arctic was just about. Minus twenty or twenty five only, you know, it's like ten degrees much colder, okay, because of the polar vortex. So you know, if, if you look at this, uh, you know, you might be thinking it's twenty twelve. Oh, okay. Uh, not not twenty twelve. So, sorry, the the day after tomorrow. So I hope you know, what the, the movie. I hope, I hope the uh, what the professor predict will not happen. Um, okay. but the sun is already showing now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Now the other thing is what will further exert the, the the price on food 
in the coming decades is because Asia fastest growing middle class. Now by 2030, Asia could represent two thirds of the global middle class population. Okay. India by 2030, in terms of purchasing power parity, would rank number one. Right now it's China. By 2030, India would rank number one in terms of purchasing power parity. Okay, China number two, US would go to third spot, and Indonesia would claim sixth spot in the world's top 10. Okay, so that's how it's going to change the demographic of the entire Asia Pacific. Now, in China, that's going to be 350 million. Okay, in India, 380 million. Rest of Asia, 210 million, but the rest of the world is only 130 million. So that population growth in Asia, and if you look at Asia consumption of food, is frying, okay, always a lot of deep fried. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, definitely. Okay, so that that would actually uh, uh, be a demand for vegetable oil, definitely. Okay, but we are also facing a climb climactal change in the world weather system. So on one hand, you have demand from a growing population, and then there's, there could be production disruption. So that's why you know, the price of food, uh, the, the price of, uh, of, of food is going to go up. And so uh, those that are in the plantation could also see uh, an increase in price, okay? And that's why, you know, because of this growth of middle class, as I mentioned just now, okay, can you imagine that, you know, in India, you have a population of middle class that by 2030 would surpass the entire United States population, okay? And they will be buying personal hygiene products. Demand for oil chemicals will also shoot up. Yeah, but not only personal hygiene products, they could be buying cars, getting insurance. Yeah, you know. yeah. You know, yeah. a, a lot more stuff can, can yeah. emerge out of this uh, yeah. growing middle class yeah. from booming from Asia. Yeah. yeah, but also, you know, we are looking at, you know, certain climate change that could impact. So we do not know where we stand in the next uh, next decade. But definitely the early signs could, uh, when, when this uh, grand solar minimum plays out, okay, I think plantation, you, you can readily see disruption in the global food supply chain. You can see disruption in, in plantation crops. Okay. And that could be the early indication. Yeah. And of, I mean, not only, you know, it's, it's balance. If yeah. it really happens, it's the balance yeah. okay, in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Then on top of that, um, of course, if certain countries become colder, that could exert a migration also, okay, into certain cities that are more uh, warmer, that are warmer. And uh, that could be geopolitical conflict, okay? But it's it's very it's it's going to be a very challenging decade next year, okay? And uh, to to such extent, maybe that's why China now is building artificial sun. Artificial sun? Yeah, you know, uh, China is going to build artificial sun that use um, that they will send satellites to space that will collect solar power and then beam it back down to the earth. Oh wow! You know, okay. and they are exploring artificial moon so that the amount of uh, what is that in the moon? Uh, that they want to also us. harnessing solar power to so that the that satellite becomes a source of illumination that will be like another moon in the sky so that it gives the it it it, it can it can allow crops you know like to twenty four hours to get light. Okay, so to that extent, you know, China that's what China is doing. Okay, uh, how, how would that affect uh, Malaysia, especially in Palm Ma region? Malaysia, I think uh, we are still very safe in the equatorial region. We, we won't see, uh, you know, us, we won't see snow falling, I think. But what we will see is because we are in the center and therefore we could likely see thunderstorm and hot weather, um, you know, many times greater than what we experienced, you know, in the El Nino, La Nina and El Nino kind of thing. Because if that, that, Weather fluctuation happens, uh, it can also um, uh, impact uh, Malaysia plantation crops as well. Okay, especially if there's severe flooding. Uh, okay. So, 
then looking at rise of middle income group in Malaysia, what will, uh, in Asia, what will happen? Rising disposable income and burgeoning middle income group in Asia could drive greater consumption of food and goods. Okay, therefore, Asia demand of vegetable will rise over the next decade. However, this de decade of rising demand will come head on with the grand solar minimum, which can put pressure on global supply chain. Okay, while well, it could augur well for plantations, which will likely see demand rising and supply declining, this could also lead to global inflation, which threatens economic growth. Okay, and governments would have a tough time um, managing food inflation. Okay, so yeah, that's about it for today. Mm, all right, so thank you so much, PC, for your sharing. So now we'd like to open it for question and answer. If any questions, you can ask uh, PC. Okay. All right, the first question I have on my screen is that uh, just now you mentioned that the banning of the IC vehicles uh, will, will impact the palm oil. Could you explain a, a bit more in detail? Um. Okay, a number of European nations by 2025 have it in their policy that they would not allow uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. Now, what is internal combustion engine vehicles? Are those vehicles that use fossil fuel okay, to start up the engine. Okay? Whereas the government in the EU is encouraging people to convert to fully electrical. Mm. Okay, so uh, can you tell us, like, uh, uh, people uh, at one of the attendees are asking, what is your forecast price of palm oil for 2019? <laughs> I, I, I think I will not put any forecast, but definitely if, let's say, uh, things to look out for, yeah. Now, what could impact the, the, the price of palm oil uh, moving forward? I think the, it will still all be around the trade deal, so-called trade deal with the uh, US-China thing. If you look at it, the trade deal, my personal opinion, okay, um, and I'm not a fortune teller, I just I just base it on what I know, okay. I don't think the trade deal will happen, okay. But then, if the trade deal does not happen, okay, will US revert to a uh, trade war with China, okay, and then China starts to impose uh, limits to soybean oil uh, import. If let's say China, right, right now China says that we will buy more soybean, okay, and that's why, okay, uh, once the trade deal news is out, palm oil price actually was going up during the trade war, but then it stopped going up, okay, because that's a trade deal. Now, if let's say the trade war is back into motion, then I think that palm oil has some extra link to move up higher because China could be back to banning U.S. agricultural product. But on the meanwhile, I don't think the upside is very, very huge because Russia now is moving to give uh, to, to lease out land for Chinese farmers who wants to convert the land into soybean plantations. Okay, that's also happening. So while on the upside may be a bit limited, okay, Again, China, uh, China demand will also be uh, moving up. Like recently, they have agreed to buy uh, more palm oil from Malaysia, which could be good for the counters uh, within the, the short to medium term. Now. Yeah. Mm, all right. So the next question we have on the screen is that, uh, you know, on one of your slide, you mentioned that the palm oil product export reached 998 billion in 2018. Mm. And then another sentence said that they contributed 65 billion of total export. What is the difference between these two figures? Okay. Sir? Okay, I think uh, one is palm oil. Uh, sorry, I think the other one is total palm oil products. I think that's a typo error there. Okay, so is it the first one? Is the palm oil? Uh, total palm oil products. That's why it's much higher. Oh, and this one is? Uh, palm oil. Palm oil. Yeah. Okay, so one is a total palm oil product, the other one is palm oil. Yes, that includes uh, the oil. Total palm oil products will be oil chemicals and such. Mm, okay, 
So next question I have is, uh, what do you think about using debt to asset ratio to evaluate a plantation company? Um, debt to debt to asset ratio, yes, you can you can also use that as an alternative. Uh, it's really up to you. Now, for me, why why I use total liabilities is because I want to know the total damage that it can do to a company. Like, if let's say, um, for example, uh, if you use just only that, then it's a form of borrowings. But what if uh, that company has a lot of other uh, non-current liabilities that are not uh, that are not uh, let's say uh, has anything to do with that, then I want to know what's the extent of the damage. So that's why I use total liabilities instead. Okay, so it's entirely up to the person actually. If you prefer more at least with that because other other items in the non-current or current liabilities is not, uh, is, is not a criteria, it's not an important criteria to you, then it's also up to you. But for me, I use the total because I want to know the fullest extent of the damage that you could do to a company's uh, balance sheet. Mm. All right. So the next question is, uh, what do you think of using return on equity, return of capital employed, and return on SM and analyzing plantation company? When assessing a company, I try not to use too many metrics to measure. Okay, because it can give conflicting signals. Now, why do I say uh, you, let's? Why do I say like this? Because if you use return on equity, now a company's return on equity can be very huge. If let's say the equity is very small, now how can a company's equity be very small? If let's say it has a lot of debt. If let's say a company has a lot of debt, the equity could be small, and then the return on equity could be very magnificent. So that's why I look at only certain things that I know make sense to me immediately. Okay, for example, if debt, um, debt to equity ratio, okay, uh, immediately tells me that um, that company is, is it, does it meet my criteria? Rather than looking at return on equity and then, hey, the equity is so huge. But then after I do the uh, mathematics, Okay, the return to equity is really not very big. So sometimes you have to be very careful when you look at this kind of metrics. I want to use metrics that make sense to me. Likewise, you should too. You should adopt metrics that make sense to you yourself. Okay, because you are the investing person. Right? Mm, all right. So the next question is, um, can you comment on the oil extraction rate and the canal extraction rate? Um, to be frank, this one I can't. I can't. Uh, uh, I can't. You don't study in detail yet, right? I don't study that uh, to that detail. Okay. For for example, but what what you mean by oil extraction rate? Like uh, how 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 efficient are they in extracting the oil from the from the, from the fruits? Uh, I think for me, I don't look into that kind of statistics. Uh, for for uh, for my own analysis now. But if you want to go into that detail, it's also up to that person. For example, how how I summarize whether um, whatever process that is being done, okay, is actually an an improvement of efficiency. Okay, I look at the overall thing. Okay, for example, if let's say per uh, the cost of the the, the cost of uh, production or the cost of the revenue, okay, increases less while revenue increases more then i would immediately know that hey you know that's efficiency okay rather than look into detail of the operational uh, uh nitty-gritty of abstraction is this percentage and so forth and so on i would look at the overall picture because to me the overall efficiency of a company matters most than just a single part of the operation whether they achieve uh, that level of efficiency or not. So I will look at the overall, yeah. Mm, okay, so do you know uh, uh, like which of the plantation company have the lowest cost of production? And is there, do you have any idea who is the most efficient planter? I would look at, I don't look at the all the across the individual 
uh, uh, counters who has the best efficiency. I look at generally, okay, for example, how, how I derive whether a company meets my investment criteria or not. Like I share with you certain uh, metrics, okay, uh, debt to equity ratio, uh, current ratio, revenue growth, and all those. I will assign a certain uh, so-called KPI, okay, like, you know, current current ratio should be uh, more than one, debt to equity ratio less than 1.5. I will put this all as part of my KPI. So when a company that meets all the KPI most, okay, I put a yes, 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 or if they fail to meet, no, then I will check against where counter, which one have the most yes. If that counter have the most yes, then that means that company really meets the most of your investment criteria. Okay, just as it will meet the most of my investment criteria. I wouldn't go into uh, certain details. Okay, only things that I want to know make sense to me. I hope that's answer your question. Mm, okay. All right. Well, there, are, there are so many questions. So the next question is, yeah, because there are more questions popping out, so I missed my question. So the next question is, uh, when you mentioned that there will be more middle-income population which will stimulate the consumption of palm oil, would there be a consumption pattern shift towards a more healthier oil as suggested by developed, uh, developed nation? I think what is most important is that, you know, every... Every producing nation, whether it's rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, or palm oil, they are fighting for a share of the market. But I think um, there are certain research that is done that uh, palm oil actually uh, ranks above some of the other oil in terms of uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, chemicals. Okay, so in that sense, I think people would often buy certain things because of pricing, okay, because of product knowledge, and also because of the of, of its usage. Okay, so for example, if let's say um, for the for a restaurant business, using palm oil actually helps to help help them to actually fry stuff much more efficiently, then yes, there will be demand. Just like if let's say a person, uh, the consumer, when they go into the supermarket, you know, sunflower oil costs much higher than palm oil, then it doesn't, um, it, it, it doesn't meet their budget in terms of uh, purchasing that, that, uh, that particular oil, then they might opt for palm oil as well. So a lot of it depends on the pricing and such. But if let's say people are moving up in the middle income, uh, middle income group. Okay, definitely their taste would also change. So that is that is why it depends on the education of the consumer. And I think um, where Malaysia palm oil is concerned, it is a constant battle fighting for market share as well as providing the right information because there's a lot of disinformation outside as well. I see. Now, um I still have a lot of questions on my uh, screen, but we can't do all. Just let me attempt one more. Uh, some people say that thousand eight is the floor for the FCPO for the CPO price, as the cost of production is around that level. What do you think about that? Now, there's there's a few things that would happen. Um, now, two thousand eight was also because of the global financial crisis. You know. Um, suddenly it's like the end of the world. Looking at the global debt situation and the way that global debt has grown almost uh, double of 2008. You know, if there's any crash in the market, yes, it's going to affect uh, uh, Malaysia no different than it did uh, in 2008. Now, Will it be a flaw in terms of the price? That could be the the flaw may be may be higher this time, maybe because of inflation. Okay. If you it may not fall low, I, I think it won't fall lower than two thousand eight. Uh, 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 to be frank, because you know 
after so many years, there's bound to be certain inflation. But if let's say a crash does come, it will definitely affect people's um, expenditure, uh, expenditure patterns, people's consumption, and that could influence uh, uh, the price of palm oil to a certain extent. Yeah. Mm, right. So let me let's do a last questions. So like uh, one of the company that you mentioned just now is Simon W Plantation. Uh, has been very focused on the uh, downstream business and uh, is it downstream business is the future earning machine for the plantations category to a certain extent i think a company needs to have a balance of a few um, upstream uh, um, exposure to upstream as well as downstream. yes to a certain extent if let's say we are look anticipating that you know, the uh, middle income group will grow very, very fast in Asia. Definitely having a good downstream business helps in uh, able to push your product to the consumers um, efficiently and effectively. Okay, but then again, you need to weigh whether that company, okay, internal, internally uh, in, its financial, in its balance sheet and in its income statement that they meet that kind of criteria for you to consider investing. Whether it's time derby, whether it is bolstered and such, you know, you need to do a detailed research and not just to hear from me what I think, okay? Sometimes, you know, if I can be right, I'll be, I'll be very, very rich, uh, richer than a lot, of, a lot of people already. But sometimes we can base on current situation in order to put some uh, estimate and some and some of our thoughts into our investment idea but if you want to really be serious okay don't just listen to what people say do your own research yes if let's say they have higher exposure in the downstream business what about their debt level what about uh what about their income level does it does it have income growth Okay, our revenue growth, does this have net profit growth? How is their current ratio? How is their debt to equity ratio? Now, these are the things that you need to do a research and understand it, okay, before you make an investment. Mm, all right. Yeah, thank you so much, PC, for your time in this uh, webinar. All right. Okay. So, uh, let's uh, do a, a bit more of a promotion for our next webinar. <laughs> So our next webinar is focusing on the beginner session. So we will cover conventional versus online investing. So it will be happening on 2nd April. Uh, uh, it's a Tuesday, 8.30 to uh, 9, uh, 8.30 to 10 p.m. Let me just uh, quickly put the link in the chat box. So if you want to register for our next webinar, please go to our chat box and click at the link and register it right away okay i just leave the registration link on the chat box so in the next webinar we'll cover should we go through a conventional investing or should we go through online investing all right so uh with that i want to thank pc for spending your time with us to talk about plantation industry for a fair bit and uh, for those of you who tune in today i'm um, very thank you so much for your time in uh, learning from us about uh, plantation industry outlook with that uh, thank you so much yeah, have a pleasant you, rest of the day okay this is shane signing off